Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fabiola Hanna. I teach at the School of Media Studies at the New School. The name of this talk is uh, Polyvocality and Interactive Documentary, Collective Reading and Listening. I'm very excited to be sharing this new work. It's been uh, on my mind for uh, uh, the last couple of years, and I'm very excited to be sharing it with you. Um, I am hoping to uh, continue working through the talk and editing it so that I can publish it as an article. So I welcome all feedback. Um, so let me get started. This paper is informed by two ongoing parallel themes in creative practice and scholarship. The first theme on listening. After decades of scholarship, the role of listening is being centered in how communication is understood. We see it in this conference where listening is one of the key themes, uh, thanks to the scholarly work of Gemma Corradi Fiumara, Susan Bickford, Iris Marion Young, Tanya Dreher, Elizabeth Lipari, Kate Lacey, Dylan Robinson, among others, as well as artists including Pepon Osorio, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, Natalie Bookchin, and Hank Willis Thomas, um, among many as well. We're finally at the turning point where listening is no longer seen as a passive component of communication. And the second theme, the field of interactive documentary, which has also recently seen an important shift towards polyvocal work, enabled on the one hand by the digital medium, and on the other by a desire to make space for the range of perspectives that multiple voices contribute to breaking with the convention of an individual perspective whether that of the character on screen or of the author. Interactive documentaries have made space for a collective form of speaking. Um, given both of these themes, I'd like to propose thinking about a collective notion of listening, um, a collective listening in interactive documentary. My own creative work participates in this shift by means of an interactive documentary slash narrative intelligence project that I'm building about the contested perspectives on daily life in Lebanon from 1943 up to the present, which automatically edits together people's individual video recorded memories into constructed collective conversations. I won't be diving into this um, work in this talk, but I'm really thinking about these impossible conversations and what kinds of infrastructure are needed to facilitate a collective speaking, a collective listening, and a collective being heard. In my scholarly writing, I study how our digital environments broadly, and software in particular, align with media makers' intentions of using video archives to make space for marginalized communities' silenced histories, Intentions that the software sometimes resists due to inherited and un unquestioned assumptions. This work involves in large part a rethinking of what it means to listen. As examples of a device of meaningful listening that might be helpful in software design, in this paper, I analyze two polyvocal nonfiction films, Lana Lynn's The Cancer Journals Revisited, and Irene Lustig's Yours in Sisterhood, both came out in 2018, to study some approaches used to stitch together the different collectives, which can inform other forms of listening that can be carried into the digital media of interactive documentary. My hope is to investigate the importance of collective listening as we interactive media makers and scholars build and critique polyvocal projects. If IDOCS makers could take on this kind of inquiry, we would be one step closer to making sure the intentions of our IDOCs match the resulting outcomes. In these films, both filmmakers have invited volunteers to read aloud on camera. In the case of Lynn, the invited 27 writers, artists, activists, healthcare advocates, and current and former patients um, she invited them to read Black, fem feminist, Black lesbian feminist poet Audre Lorde's classic 1980 memoir of her breast cancer experience. And in the case of Lustig, she recruited participants in 32 different U.S. states to read aloud and respond to a selection of letters to the editor at this magazine from the 70s, covering issues of divorce, abortion, rape, discrimination, among many other feminist issues of the day. 
Both films are critically self-reflexive. As part of their project, the filmmakers expose the multiple aspects of the mechanics of filming these readings. Although both films use a similar device of requesting volunteers to read aloud on screen, their results sometimes converge and sometimes diverge from one another. In the Cancer Journals Revisited, Lynn herself has undergone treatment for breast cancer, as have many of the readers she invited or their close relatives or friends. This results in a um, very intimate, uh, or in their, the readings are so intimately intertwined with the text that in some cases, the readers respond to the text they have just read. In addition to these readings, the film includes a wide variety of footage ranging from video of cancer centers and buildings, including the first cancer center in the US and the Callan Lord Community Health Center space at Mount Sinai, taken on raw stock film um, that Lana had for over 20 years to footage that Lynn's partner took of her during her chemotherapy treatment, which I get to into the future longer version of this talk, to footage of trees in the city, to small camera footage of the scars on Lynn's own body, as a whole, the film has a very meditative quality as if the stitching of all the components, um, the readings of Lord's text, the reading, reader's responses, and the inclusion of other footage, were seeking a different kind of language. Now, in Yours and Sisterhood, Irene Lustig invited um, these hundreds of strangers around the US to read these uh, letters that were written in the 70s and 80s. Uh, after hand selecting 300 letters from thousands of originals archived at the Sle Schlesinger Library, Lustig embarked on a meticulous process of pairing each letter with a reader, a process she has called critical casting. After video recording these live readings and then further narrowing down the project to a smaller number of readings and edited and she edited the recordings to stitch together what she has called a collective portrait of feminism now and 40 years ago. Apart from the readings, the film also contains quiet lands landscape shots that set the stage for the location of the next reader. As the landscape contains a delayed on text screen of the place. In addition, the year the letter was written is also displayed, either with the location or when the reader um, starts the reading. The film imparts a feeling of traveling across the country, as well as across time, to find out what has changed. The polyvocal component in both films results from the different ways that the individual voices are stitched together. In uh, the Cancer Journals Revisited, the most conspicuous stitch is the collective sequential reading of Lord's original text that shapes the entire arc of the film. The text itself occupies the screen also in a multiplicity of forms, sometimes as a book, at other times as printed pages collated on a black dossier, and at still others uh, read through the device of a teleprompter. Another form of stitching occurs when a reader responds to the section of Lord's text they have just read with their own thoughts, which they share live on screen, expanding on their own experiences with cancer, whether in the past, growing up, or in the present, uh, somewhere undergoing chemo at the time of filming. Or in the case of the director um, with the Callan Lord Institute, um, speaking about the medical services they provide to the larger LGBTQ community. In another instance of exposing the collective nature of this filmmaking project, the camera pans out enough to include not just a view of the current reader, but a partial view of the reader who is to follow her, here yeah, seen on the left. The point of transition from one reader to another is captured by a close-up of their hands, one person handing over the book while the other puts down her cup of tea and takes the book, then opening it into the page she will read from. The next angle of the camera is on the new reader with a partial view of the first reader. The resulting effect is of capturing and focusing on the act of listening itself, which by exposing it to the viewer 
also involves the viewer in it. This multiplicity of voices on screen seems particularly apt for Lord's own text, which itself features multiple voices. Among them, first, her direct address to the MLA audience to whom she delivered um, the text as a speech. She says, and I'm quoting her, this is a situation faced by many women, by some of you here today. Second is also the voice of Lord's daughter, selected by Lynn as one of the readers, though the viewers do not know this yet, who first reads the following in Lord's voice, and I'm, I'm um, quoting the text. But my daughter, when I told her of our topic and my difficulty with it, said, tell them about your, how you're never really a whole person if you remain silent because there's always that one little piece inside of you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak it out, one day it will just up and punch you in the mouth. Lord's daughter then responds to this reading, remembering her mother's words and the conversation. In yours and sisterhood, the stitches used to combine the series of individual readings also take a variety of forms. Most straightforwardly, the readings are consistent in their visual aesthetic. All are shot, shot outside, during the day, with the camera facing the readers, first from a long view and then a closer shot. In this way, each reading can be interpreted as an individual portrait. Additionally, almost all of the readings were conducted with a teleprompter setup that gives the impression that the readers are reading to the viewer although a few exceptions were made when the readers expressed difficulty with the teleprompter. And perhaps most significantly, the recordings present a consistent feeling of intimacy between the letter writer, the reader, and the viewer, a, ve a feeling that stems from the curatorial approach that L L Lustig implemented. Each reader was selected to match the demographic criteria available in the original letter. For example, a small town mechanic in the Midwest was paired with someone of the same profession, socioeconomic standing, gender identity, etc. In the absence of demographic information, Lustig considered an intersectional approach that reflects a 2018 desire for inclusivity that might not have been as central in the 70s. Lustig termed this process critical ca casting, and I, I don't have much time to go into the concept, but I think as uh, one that's really important also within the discussion for listening. Mm -hmm. In addition to the stitching that enabled the polyvocality, the multiplicity of voices is also mirrored in the forms of the films themselves, which enables what I'm thinking of as a kind of collective listening. In the Cancer Journals Revisited, one such kind of collective listening that is consistent throughout the film concerns the way the, the seams of the polyvocal content are handled. One example occurs at the beginning of the film when the readers create an auditory chain stitch, each one overlapping where the one before leaves off, as both voices read the same words aloud simultaneously at the moment of transition. The element of synchronous repetition symbolizes a connective, connected kind of listening. There are also other kinds of stitching. On two different occasions, Lynn's readers read the text in a language other than English, but then responds in English to both the experience of reading in Spanish, the same text she had read in English while in Argentina, which allowed a perhaps taboo subject to be considered from a non-Spanish perspective. The second reader who doesn't read in English, this time reading in German, compares the formal quality of the German language relative to the feeling of immediacy she felt in English, resulting for her in a more emotional reception of the text. This has a dual defamiliarizing effect. On English language viewers um, suddenly hearing a foreign language, and second, on the reader's new experience of a text changed for her by the language she was reading in, and her new perspective on the impact of linguistic differences on how a text is read and received. Because of all of this is happening on, live on screen as both performance and spontaneous response, it results in a form of collective listening carried out by both the speakers and re or readers 
and the viewers. In yours and sisterhood, beyond the visual aesthetic similarity, there are multiple other kinds of stitches. The readings are grouped around themes that cover discrimination at work, lifestyle, gun ownership, abortion, etc. Each of these groupings operate as a mini arc across the film. Another kind of stitching occurs at the end of the reading when the reader start, steers awkwardly, sometimes awkwardly, sometimes not uh, very calmly, into the camera, sometimes followed by a response to the letter. An additional kind of stitch also happens when a voiceover from the next scene overlaps when the reader is silently staring into the camera, where the audio acts as a stitch. The format of reading, then response, guides the film back and forth in the voice of the past to the present and back again. The stitching of times conveys the idea that not much has changed in these 40 years. This device, combined with the homogeneous landscape across the US, mirrors the idea that Miss Magazine conveyed in the 70s, that despite the distance across the US, much of the feminist issues are experienced similarly by people who identify as female, um, contributing to their politics of sisterhood. Finally, both filmmakers additionally used several devices to express a reflexive mode of filmmaking, exposing the mechanics of the filmmaking in a way I see as catalyzing the collective listening that ensues. For example, Lynn leaves in footage where readers address her informally outside the content of the script. The gaze of the reader is another such device. The first reader who has been looking down at the book in her hands then suddenly with a direct and powerful gaze shifts her focus to look straight at the camera. This happens with at three other occasions um, where readers perhaps even directed by a teleprompter providing viewers with a glimpse at the process of the filmmaking as it is happening. Thereby, thereby involving the viewers by means of their role as witnesses to the filmmaking process in that um, process, an acknowledged and invited form of collective listening in. Um, similarly, the viewer is also invited into the filmmaking spaces and scenes where a microphone is being adjusted or when a reader is waiting for the recording for the official reading or when Lynn asks for readers thoughts after a reading. Yet another kind of stitching that occurs across the film is in the moments in between readings of the text, where Lynn's own voice is presented by means of an on-screen text. In uppercase, um, sans serif font, where she references herself, as here, and in a lowercase typewriter font, uh, as a more disembodied voiceover narrator, sharing facts about what is on screen, such as where Lord grew up, or the fact that uh, when Lord taught police officer students at John Jay, they attended class um, armed with guns. Lynn also leaves, um, leaves in the word action a few times throughout the film as she directs uh, a reader to start the reading, pointing to her authorial stitching as well. Like the Cancer Journals Revisited, Yours and Sisterhood includes many of the above reflexive devices. In addition, Lustig makes a few moves of her own, including, for example, uh, where she can be heard inviting a reflection on the letter that was just read or asking up follow-up questions. At other moments, a reader is interrupted, for example, when an airplane passes overhead during a response by the reader. There are additional elements I will expand on in the version of this talk I'm preparing for the article, but I'll stop here for now. As I close this talk, I'd like to highlight two additional ideas. In addition to the films presenting a collaborative form of reading, I'd like us to consider the idea of a collaborative form of listening on the part of the readers, as well as the viewers and filmmakers. And two, Lustig has termed the reader's engagement with the letters as an embodied listening that allows for the viewer to experience the 40-year-old words of the letter writers voiced by present-day readers. But I think it also makes space for listening as a collective act, which takes place in the very fact of the viewer witnessing it. Gemma Coradi-Fiumara writes, 
Listening involves the renunciation of a predominantly molding and ordering activity, a giving up sustained by the expectation of a new and different quality of relationship. Listening, in Koradi Fumara's terms, is about refusing to predetermine or expect and anticipate what someone will say before or as they say it. Both filmmakers present a multiplicity of voices and a multiplicity of st stitch work, which despite both filmmakers having built films on this shared move of inviting participants to read text aloud, the fact of their presenting multiple voices and forms of stitch work contributes to the viewer's experience of surprise and unsettling of conventions, opening up the potential for collective listening. The paper has considered the parallel requirements in a project like this of connective stitch work, not only to stitch individualized speakers into a collective, but additionally to stitch viewers and listeners into a collective. These are but a few examples of how a collective listening can be brought about in films, but also in interactive documentaries. I hope to have shown that both the content for polyvocality and the infrastructure for collective listening are needed to enable the participatory goals of interactive documentary that the field has been calling for. Thank you.